Greetings, sir and sirettes, and welcome back to Stellaris with me, Alathrix. And, of course, welcome to a brand new series where we're going to be doing things a little bit differently. Over the last few playthroughs, I think I have started to lose track of the thing I love about Stellaris the most, and that is the world building, well, the galaxy building, and everything else which makes the whole game feel so much more alive. You can really roleplay this game and focus on all the little events because there is so much going on, and I've sort of lost track of that. I've ended up going far more into the min-maxing mechanics of things and just going for the endgame crisis. Well, today we're starting a proper Let's Play format series where we're going to be doing the opposite, really focusing on the Empire itself, focusing on its choices, role-playing the Empire, so perhaps doing some things which aren't really be the best for us in terms of our power level, but things which the Empire would do, along with just focusing on the events more and hopefully having a lot of fun that way. Also, this whole run is going to be quite heavily modded. A full list of all the mods I'm going to be using will be in the description below, of course, along with links to them over on the Steam Workshop. But the main ones we're going to be looking at right away are the Ethics and Civics Classic, which is why we have all of the different Civics choices and Ethics choices you see in front of you, which have really, really worked well with the Honor Bound. It's actually what made me choose the Honor Bound over the other role-playing choices, because these fit just so well. We're also using the Starnet AI, which makes the AI significantly more difficult, and we'll get onto that more in a second when we actually choose our difficulty, because we're going to have scaling difficulty, and then set the AI to a really, really difficult level, with the AI mod also enabled. It's gonna make the game very interesting, especially since we're not always going to be doing the min-maxing perfect things all the time. I've also um, currently started to run species diversity, which means different types of species will have different ethics, sorry, different um, traits available to them, which means you kind of want a mix of them because it means that some of the species will be better at doing things than others which makes everything a lot more interesting. I've also added some extra colours to all the different flags and everything, so hopefully it'll be a bit more interesting when we're actually trying to discern who is who, since that can be a little bit weird sometimes. Again, all of the links will be in the description below. So let's take a look then into exactly what the Honor Bound are and what they're going to be like as we play them. And I think the easiest way is just to take a quick look at the civics. So first of all, Martial Brotherhood. Armed forces are considered to be an integral part of the society, a symbol of its unity and collectivism, to serve as an honour rather than a debt or obligation. So they very, very, very much honour their armed forces, and this is going to play into pretty much everything they do. This means we have our soldiers, producing unity in addition to everything else we also get one extra soldier job per 20 populations then we get some extra research speed for military theory which i quite like and some extra army morale which is all but useless honestly but it's it's nice to be there the main thing really is we get extra soldiers and they produce our unity soldiers of course also produce defensive armies for a planet and most importantly increase navy capacity this empire is going to have a ridiculous Navy capacity, so I expect low-tech, loads of ships, loads of alloys everywhere. We are going to be a dominant force if we go down this route, which is good because they're all about helping others and challenging the strong. Now this Civic here is the Civic which made me choose the Honor Bound over the other choices because it perfectly fit everything I was talking about when I first made all the different Empire choices. Because the Honor Bound, their main objective is to safeguard as many lives as possible. They are here to protect the liberties and the lives of everyone around them. Even those who don't like them, they don't care as long as they're not being cruel. If they are a particularly cruel Empire, if they are a very aggressive Empire, Empire, the Honor Bound may step in, turning them into a vassal just so they're safe and not harming anyone else, or perhaps just to weaken them enough so they can't harm anyone else whilst protecting weaker empires, even if the weaker empires hate the Honor Bound for whatever reason. They are, of course, also the protectors of the galaxy and are here to try and safeguard everyone. And because of that, they are interventionalists. Being naturally open to alien cultures, this civilization, nevertheless, does not neglect to use military force when it seems justified to maintain the global balance of powers. 
So this is a very long civic, but essentially what it means is that defensive and guarantee independence, which is one I never do but will definitely do with this empire, do not cost influence to maintain. They want defensive pacts with everyone, they will come to the aid of anyone they deem non-evil, and will also guarantee the independence, which is essentially a one-way defensive pact where I will defend you if you're attacked, but I don't expect you to defend me if I am attacked. I'll definitely do that to other weaker empires if at all possible. But then, also, our militarist faction is modified. Rather than being completely aggressive, they actually like Liberation Wars, which is a war which changes other empires to our, our ethics rather than conquering them, which is definitely something I'll do a lot of. But also, they like defensive facts. They really want you to be friendly of anyone. We can only have limited bombardments, because why would we have indiscriminate when all we're trying to do is destroy the military on the planet? We are being as nice as we can be, considering we are shelling a planet from orbit. Following on from this, our Federation Navy capacity contribution is increased by 100%, basically meaning any Federation we're with, we are contributing a lot to the Federation fleet, meaning the Federation fleet will be incredibly powerful. If we have vassals, they give us more, uh, more Navy capacity as well, and we also have more diplomatic weight from our fleet power, so we can hopefully change the Galactic Council for the better. We are going to be pretty much all for any military options, things like the Reddit Shield, where everyone has to have a certain amount of fleet power ready just in case of a threat, but also we're probably going to be against anything particularly evil. For instance, a certain type of trade, we're going to try and ban as soon as we can. Owning populations is something this empire will not tolerate. I've had to record this bit, by the way, like seven times, because I keep on reading it, moving on to the next thing, then realising there's more to talk about. So, also, we can only have one rival, because we're not meant to be aggressive or antagonistic, but also, we have a plus 30% cost to our claim influence, which means, if we want to claim territory, it costs almost a third more. That's very expensive, because that's not what we're about. We would much rather convert others to our way of thinking, than outright kill them and take over their territory. If everyone thinks like us, there will be peace. I can think of a lot of evil people who thought the same thing, but we're being nice about it. And with that, let's move on to ethics before we go on to the final civic, which is a serious one to discuss. Lots of talking today. So with our ethics, I've changed this around a lot. At one point it was like this, another point this is all the way over here. It was all over the place, but this I think just fits the best in my opinion. So there are obviously a lot of new ethics types here, things like um, competitive, elitism, we have libertarian over here, then we have um, pluralism, there's just loads of stuff. So I'll just discuss what I've actually chosen. So what I end up going with, which by the way has just changed a little bit between clips because I've got to update to this, is we are regular libertarian. Libertarians preserve democratic values with citizens being directly involved in the governing process through the mechanisms of either representative or direct democracy. This makes our factions more powerful, which definitely works for this empire because all of our factions really represent the playstyle, especially with interventionists actually altering our military faction. We also get some extra admin cap, which is nice, and we get an extra chance of ethic shift, which means our people are so involved with the political process, they're allowed to change their minds. I know, a truly radical concept. We are regular xenophiles, giving us extra trust growth, extra diplomatic, sorry, minus diplomatic influence cost, which is nice, so it costs less influence. Our trade attractiveness is increased, and we have an extra envoy. We make people like us, and we like to trade with them, which... Yeah, we probably would. And then we are cooperative, basically meaning our workers are a bit more powerful within our empire, which makes sense because we have so much of an emphasis on our soldiers and our military, this will be them, because the regular soldier jobs are worker jobs, this will make them happy, and also gives them more political power. It also increases our research speed for society a little bit, which is nice, and housing usage is also reduced, because we work together. Together, we stand strong, is also how this empire kind of functions. Then finally, we are fanatic militarists, because of course we are. Our claim cost is reduced, which we don't care about, fire rate is increased, which is great, trust growth is reduced, which is terrible, but it had to be fanatic. I can't see how this empire could not be fanatic militarists. Honestly, I would much rather go like this, but... We kind of have to have it. 
We are then a direct democracy, with people being directly involved in governing and deciding on policy initiatives, bureaucratic efficiency is increased, and both social and economical development are accelerated. So this makes our edicts cost less, which in my opinion is not a particularly great modifier, I really wish I had the extra capacity, and our workers and specialists have loads of extra political power, really making us incentivized to make everyone as happy as possible. Because you've got a lot of workers, and if they get unhappy, you lose a lot of stability with this much power with them. If you go all the way down to the extreme imperial, workers have no power, rulers have all the power, as long as the rulers are happy. With me, if the rulers are happy, we don't care, because they're not really holding all the power. And our final civic, the one here in gold. Full citizenship and political responsibility that comes with it is limited to those who have served a tour of duty in the military, service guarantee citizenship, and the right to elect and govern. And most importantly, we are allowing everyone to go through this who is within our empire, essentially, as long as you are willing to defend us, we will defend you and work for you. Capital buildings replace some administrator jobs with commanders, which increase the Empire's navy capacity, spawn defence armies, and most importantly, increase planetary stability. They even reduce damage from bombardment. Essentially, these make the world a lot more stable and a lot harder to kill, which is fantastic. Commanders also provide additional unity and amenities because there are some other civics where you can get extra commanders, but and this will make them stronger if we go down that route later because we will be able to get extra civics throughout the game. And there's a lot of options, though I think I'll probably just go with the basic warrior culture because I adore that, and maybe the welfare state, keeping our workers happy, and giving us extra regular jobs. Once you've finished w with the military, we care for you in every way possible. We are nice like that. Uh, so what else does this do? This also allows the special edict patriotic call, I have no idea what that does by the way, but then the passive effect, plus 25% navy capacity, minus 15% war exhaustion gain, but our army is a bit more expensive because we're caring for them, we are putting all of our extra money into it, which is kind of why I want to go with fanatic cooperative, rather than regular cooperative, because that actually hurts our trade value, and I like that being the idea of we're losing money because we're spending it on all these extra programs. But sadly, then I'd have to lose one of the other options and ethics, and I just don't think that fits for that little extra bit of flavour. So, that was a lot to get through. I hope I've explained it decently, because there are so many things here to explain. But essentially, it means we care for our workers, we care for our soldiers, and our military is everything to us. We also love everyone. Now sadly, although we are using the mod which allows different species to have different traits, let's just go to Humanoid for a second to showcase this. There we are, all these extra ones at the bottom which are unique to humanoids for instance. Necroids don't actually have anything unique about them yet. It has been balanced for the patch apparently, so it does work completely correctly, and in, t and in the tests I've done I haven't seen any issues, but we have no unique traits. We are what we are, and I'm completely fine with that. We are extremely adaptive. I mean, we come from a planet called Forge, a planet which may be a little bit too close to the sun. It's a very difficult place to live, but we have adapted and came together stronger because of this. We are strong, because we are strong. We are nomadic, unruly, and repugnant. And repugnant, I think, works the best here because we are so strict. I can imagine this species being so difficult to get along with just because of how strict they are with their rules and how they want everything to go forwards. They are unruly because because they are, well, I think it fits. They are completely prone to ethic shift chances, so they're constantly changing their minds about things. They are fanatic militarists after all. I can imagine brawls breaking out a lot. Not brawls which end up with a loss of life or civil wars, but enough brawls that they are probably very unruly and difficult to maintain everyone at once. There is very little else to say about the Empire except for our origin, on the shoulders of giants. This is a really interesting origin which I've never really covered. Essentially, we have an archaeological site instantly within our home system, and we are on a quest to find out just what is actually going on. So I will actually be reading these events for once, rather than just skipping over them, which is pretty nice. Now I have looked at the Mod Jam mods as well, um, if you want to get more details of these, I will also link this in the description, but I would also recommend people like Acebeck who have been covering these, uh, these mods in more detail, along with the Stellaris Twitter and everything else. This is for Mod Jam 2020, and there is a lot of options, but honestly, I just felt on the shoulders of Giants is one I really wanted to cover and fit the Empire well, 
but there is a lot of choices here. I may start covering some of these as, as one-off videos, perhaps in the future, if there's some interest there. But yeah, we're just sticking with On the Shoulders of Giants for now. Our ruler is the Grand Protector Shiny Plate. I forgot to rename you. <laughs> well, good job I checked. You know what, no. Shiny Plate, our Grand Protector. There we are. And let's make sure that Grand Protector is the same for male and female. That would be great. Yeah, I think everything is in order. So now let's get to exactly how we're going to be playing this game. Let's save that one last time. And let's have a look at this. We are going to be in a galaxy which is huge. We're going to have... Uh, let's go with the elliptical galaxy since I've been going with ring almost every time. Otherwise, we're going to increase the AI empires up to 18. I don't want too many because with the Starnet AI, they're hyper-aggressive anyway. This won't really increase the difficulty. It's just going to increase how many different types of empires are out there, which is just going to be interesting, honestly. Habitable world and everything else is set to the default primitive civilizations. I'm tempted to increase a little bit just because I do find that interesting. Crisis strength is set to maximum. The end game, I'm actually going to push back a little bit to 2,350. Yeah, that way we can be a little bit weaker and, like, that's not the end. Um, normally, you'd have it set to this. This is the default, so it's still 50 years early. It's just I want to have a more lax experience, especially since we're going to be role-playing stuff. I don't want the end game to be the ultimate end, really. We're more playing towards our own goals, which is peace in the galaxy. If we can bring peace to everything, we have certainly won. But this is a nice end fun, anyway. With difficulty, we're not going with Grand Admiral because that is really difficult with this mod. We are going with Admiral, still very difficult. The AI gets major bonuses to its economy, research, and naval capacity. But we are going to be using Scaling Difficulty, which takes a bit of explaining since the last time I mentioned this, quite a few people didn't quite fully understand how it works, which is fair enough because it is pretty weird. So how scaling difficulty works is at the very start of the game, the AI will have no bonuses, essentially treating the game like the regular difficulty, where there's no inherent economic, scientific, or military advantages over the player, but then over time, and scaling all the way until the end game start year, which is 2350, those modifiers will be added until you get to the difficulty you've selected. So let's just say, hypothetically, after 75 years, the game is then essentially in the Captain or Commodore difficulty. When it gets to 2350, it will be all the way up into Admiral. The reason for this is because the Starnet AI does a great job of making even regular difficulty difficult, but I have noticed still that in the very late game, the AI still doesn't quite keep up with you. I'm not quite sure what it starts doing wrong. It could be the Ascension perks, I'm not quite sure how it picks those, or something else, but the player does start to really outscale other empires, even if the player isn't doing amazingly well. This way, by the end game, the AI is going to have a lot of advantages to still keep it difficult. So, Early aggression is going to be easier, then as time goes on, everyone will get harder and harder and harder, and hopefully Admiral will give us enough challenge, while not being an utter just <laughs> crushing difficulty when it gets to the very, very late game. So that is that. And now, we begin. The Honor Bound, join the galaxy as a whole. Ruler Shiny Plate. We begin on the left-hand side of the galaxy, near the galaxy's core. Origin, of course, is on the shoulders of giants. Ours is a history of oddities and inconsistencies. We have found ancient ruins older than some archaeological excavations of primitive villages. We have unearthed swords, axes, and even rifles, which far predate stone-tipped spears and bows. A peculiar history, however, did not prevent us from stepping readily into a futuristic era of spaceflight. We have now managed to escape the gravity of our home planet, aiming for other planets and bodies in our solar system, and beyond. We had scarcely left the atmosphere before the oddities emerged anew, strange signals of alien origin coming from within our own solar system. And that will unlock in a second, there we go. So we now have an archaeological site which is located over here on a small moon. Ex Gravitas. A string of strange anomaly readings is emanating from the surface of Phoebe. We need to launch a surface excursion to find out more, which is exactly what I'm going to do, our science officer. Ah, uh, good old... Squaff. Really? 
The science officer is called Squaff. I kind of love that. Okay, Squaff, you are going to be one I remember. And thankfully, Scarf is resilient. <laughs> Squaff is resilient and is uh, longer lived the most, which is very good indeed. So we are definitely going to want to upgrade our ships as soon as possible. Genome mapping is a big deal for the health of our population. Although saying that, ground defense planning is very much us. You know, I wouldn't normally go for this. No, I think for now, uh, population growth, because it is all to do with the health of our citizens, which we definitely care about. Either of these work here. Um, I'll definitely go for this early. Normally, I don't go for this until very, very late game, because I don't really care about it. But I'll definitely be focusing on that somewhat soon. You know what? No. It gives us more navy capacity as well. We're definitely focusing on that. It's our military. And with our military as well, we're also going to get coil guns. So our um, corvettes are going to be brutal. Now, normally, I would actually scrap our corvettes. And I'm just going to rename them in a sec. Famine. They're called Famine. This is the... Oh, of course, because I have the Necroid naming scheme for once. That's brutal. That's very brutal. Yeah, normally I'd scrap these, but I will be leaving them as they are. Because we need some defense, I imagine. That's what our empire would want to do. As for everything else, we are still going to be using the market to its fullest extent, as long as it doesn't clash with everything else. And with that, we're going to start clearing up the sprawling slums of our people. We are now in space, it's time to care for our people, and start harvesting everything here. Though I imagine we're probably going to go heavily into alloys, though right now our, uh, our amenities are quite low because we are repugnant. So, still sticking with the happiness of our people, I think the first thing we'll build is a hollow theatre. Normally wouldn't build this here, honestly, but I do want to try and keep our people as happy as possible. And with that, let's have a look-see at our living standards. You know what? Uh, social welfare. Yep, straight into that. That'll make our people significantly happier. Huh. Decent conditions is already plus 10% for rulers. This hardly even changes the... Um Specialists. Okay, that's absolutely fine. I would love Utopian Abundance and such, but they cost way too much, and this empire probably wouldn't go with that much decadence. Social welfare, yeah, make sure everyone is well cared for, but anything which is decadence, I doubt they have that much time for. Probably wouldn't shy away from it, but probably wouldn't spend too much into it. Right now, of course, our means are actually below the minimum amount, so they're going to build some hollow theatres. We have found a comet. I'll definitely be reading some of these um, just one-off events less as time goes on, but right now, I just want to read it. A fierce plume of flame sears the heavens of forge as a comet skirts the upper stratosphere. The sheer power evident in its cosmic trajectory has made a profound impression on the capital's populace. They liken the infracturability of its path and inevitability of the honor-bound ascension to galactic supremacy. Probably read that wrong. I am dyslexic, but there we go. I finally have enough minerals, so let's go ahead and build ourselves some hollow theatres. Let's keep our people happy. Right now, they're actually not that happy because of the lack of amenities. Oh, yep, so there we go. We've got our commander here giving all sorts of bonuses, like we discussed before. And we have our soldier job because we have over 20 population, which is giving us 4 navy capacity and 2.35 unity. That's actually really good. Yeah, the, the extra soldier per 20 population is really going to uh, scale our navy capacity, especially since we get the plus 25% as well from the Republic. We're going to have a lot of ships, is what I'm trying to say. Okay, let's grab that. And we definitely need to build some more science vessels. Let's look outside and find some friends. The stations really do look brutal. Whoa, that's a research station name. Oh yeah, I forgot, you can even rename the research stations. Okay, I need some leader names, by the way, and some world names. Give me them in the comments below, because I'm gonna need loads of them and I'm not creative enough for this. I'm not renaming every single leader and every single station, though. Herschlag. Research station. Okay. Terrifying. <laughs> See, this is more normal. The BT-09L. Night shift. Dark Priestess Mining Station. What is with these names? They're so edgy. <laughs> yeah, Necroid um, is very edgy with its naming, apparently. I've never actually um, used the Necroid naming scheme since I like the humanoid and the mammalian, so I tend to stick with those. 
Ah, uh, nope, sadly not. We haven't quite made the breakthrough yet. Oh, what tradition... Okay, so... Ideally, I would choose Expansion. I may even choose Supremacy, because that makes us very strong early on. So one of these two would, what, would normally be what I'd choose, maybe then Discovery, but I honestly think Harmony. It's about stability, it's about the governing ethics attraction, it's got Bulwark of Harmony, which is so fitting for the Empire it hurts. It has Mind at Hit, it's, it's gotta be Harmony, surely. Definitely not Domination, that's the last one we'll probably pick. Diplomacy depends on who we find. I feel like some of these depend on how the game plays out, but right now... I feel like Harmony is probably the best to go with thematically. Maybe Supremacy second, but right now, since we haven't found any proof of alien life, Harmony, oh that hurts. I really don't like Harmony as the first um, tradition tree, but at least we get um, Utopian Dream and Bulwark of Harmony, so we're going to have a nice defensive start. Yeah, I'm not even going to talk about Ascension perks yet. There's way, way too much to discuss there. Oh, yeah, I forgot all the new policies. Yeah, so with the extra civics and um, ethics mod, there's loads of extra stuff to talk about here. Okay, this is going to take a second. Our scientists have found a desert world capable of supporting our species, and it's already home to some life. A joyous moment for the Empire. But yeah, so we have these new policies, and there's lots of them. Let's go through them quickly. So we have mass media. We have free media, and we have state media. Um, I'm thinking this will have to be free media. It increases libertarian ethics attraction, which obviously is what we are, whereas state is all about authoritarian. Once again, this is one I don't like picking because it decreases the stability of our planets, but it does give us one entertainer every 33 populations. And factions also gain more influence. Yeah, it has to be free media. The media is free on Forge. Telecommunications, we can have... Oh, we're not actually allowed to have civilian because, well, we are fanatic militarists. Navy capacity increased. Starbase capacity increased. Militarist ethics attraction increased. Less research station output. This is telecommunications. Yeah, makes sense. I'm definitely putting that forward towards the military. Personal weapons. Allowing citizens to buy and use personal armaments will generally improve their gun culture. But this may come at the cost of increased crime activities. Okay. Uh, current policy is limited. I would say definitely allowed. Extra army damage. Yep, everyone, remember, everyone in this empire serves in the military for a, probably a very long time. It's probably a very long tour of duty. And their culture is all about the armament and protection of their empire. So regardless how people feel about um, gun laws, I think this empire would definitely allow them 110%. Transportation logistics, currently not specified, so it's in the middle. Military transport, ship upkeep is reduced by 15%. Oh, that's lovely. Extra trade protection, population growth from immigration is reduced. Ah, oh, because we're using all the transport for the military, so there's literally less transport. Ooh, less trade value. Okay, I like that, once again, because I like the idea of some of our funds being diverted to our military. We are very militaristic. If we were evil, we would be very, very scary. Education, private education and public education. Oh, once again, it's one of these ones. I like private education here. It increases prime, don't care about that, but increases specialist output by 15%. It's so good, but it increases elitist and competitive ethics extraction, which is the opposite of what we are. Public education makes far more sense. Governing ethics attraction is increased, extra unity, less energy because we're spending it on the school system, we have less crime, um, and egalitarian and cooperation is increased, yep. Healthcare, that's going to be the exact same, we're going with public healthcare, for once it's the one I'd actually choose. Medical workers produce additional unity and amenities, but have increased upkeep. Building clinic, um, building clinics produce additional... Okay, okay, so the building clinic produces additional medical workers, but its upkeep is increased. Extra population growth, and once again, less energy, but we're funding our people. Authority, we can't do yet. Um, economics, we can't do yet. Production focus is currently mixed. I think that, that fits our empire. I don't think it go either way. Maybe m militarized. I might change that later. Trade policy. Oh, we have all sorts of options here as well. Trade value is energy and consumer. Well, actually, I think the trade policy... Okay, I'm going to stop here 
because I know for a fact some of our factions have a lot to say about these. And we can actually go to planned if we change the others. There's a lot to discuss here, but essentially we'll get onto that when we actually have our factions, which is going to be many years in the future. Squarf is the first of our leaders to gain a level. <laughs> of course he is. <laughs> well done, Squarf. Oh look, 70% happiness. Excellent, okay. Happiness is increasing in our empire. The first small step. A base of operations has been set up on the surface of FIBA, and several teams are now en route to the various anomaly sites that our scanners picked up. The significance of this mystery is simply unparalleled, and the scientific community is absolutely buzzing with theories and anticipation over what will be uncovered by the excursion teams. This is exciting! I would love to sell that, but I think the Empire wouldn't know. I mean, it's all about their mystery. They would definitely use Celebrate Diversity, using artifacts like that, and, and museum exhibits, but I don't think they'll just outright sell them. Which is annoying, because that's what I like to do. Okay, let's move over. Going to make our first outpost so that we can get our first colony. Okay, I'm gonna build a new alloy foundry, I think. Uh, right now, our alloys are quite low, honestly. We have found minerals in space, uh, nice and easily. I think we need a military, and I think the Empire would agree with that. I mean, I'm actually tempted to build a stronghold to defend us more, but yeah, I think... Um... Oh, a monument, though. We are very, very proud of our nation. A monument or a foundry. I think a foundry... Would probably be better here as well, since we are also neutral currently, well, just under neutral on consumer goods. I think for now, we'll build a foundry. And to be efficient, I'll also remove one of the jobs from our bureaucrats, which will become a foundry worker in a second. And all as well. Habitable World Survey. We now know, without a doubt, that a thriving biosphere is not something unique to forge. Both the scientific community and the public at large are eager to learn about the various forms of alien life found throughout the galaxy. Efforts to catalogue the life forms we encounter are already underway, but our xenobiologists have urged us to focus our planetary survey efforts on habitable, life-bearing worlds. Yeah, definitely. The situation I don't know how many of these to read, so feedback is very welcome, because there are a lot of events which are minor events like this. Strong energy emissions of an unknown origin make this asteroid stand out from the rest of its peers in this crowded asteroid field. And we begin research. Thanks to... Leon. It's like Leon, but with more huh. The greater good. Our empire population takes comfort in the knowledge that they are all working together for the greater good, each one a small but important part of a vastly larger whole. The asteroid has been studied, and this particular asteroid is an extrasolar capture, and appears to have been washed by some kind of exotic radiation as it plummeted through interstellar space before finally settling in the... Dongar system. <clears throat> the original source of this radiation remains unknown, but the ISS... Diseased Ambition <laughs> has been able to pick up a wealth of physics data by studying the asteroid's energy emissions. So here's 114 physics in our um, stored research, which will help out get our blue lasers a little bit faster. <laughs> diseased Ambition. And our new one is called Shrouded Hope. Okay, that's, uh, that's interesting to say the least. Okay, there we are, and, um, Merson, you're our new science officer, find us some more worlds. I'm currently building our first colony ship as well, which is why we have very, very little resource left. Okay, the next part of the archaeological site has been unlocked. Most excursion teams have reached their destinations and reported back. Artifacts buried in the ground have been uncovered. Head scientist Squaff describes them as highly accurate galactic Laser pointers, okay? Ancient machines that are emitting a strong, l tight ultraviolet beam out into space for purposes unknown. It's a bittersweet discovery. The profound, exhilarating importance of alien artifacts countered by their seemingly arbitrary purpose. But of course, we continue. And now we have enough artifacts to celebrate diversity. Display some of the minor artifacts to show the diversity of life in the galaxy. 
definitely something we'll do. And we'll also increase our Xenophile F extraction, which is good, because that's what we are. Our regular scientists have leveled up, so well done to Witten, Marthen, and Elmore. Utopian dream. The dream of a utopian future drives our people ever forward. A better tomorrow is worth fighting for. Increasing stability by 5% on all planets. Stability, of course, giving us extra everything. More resources, trade value, and immigration pull. Oh, I missed the colony ship. I like looking at the colony ships. Our colony ship is gently touched down by the outskirts of a large oasis on... Brewston Prime. Situated at the foot of a large mountain, this ideal location provides shelter from the wind and has easy access to water. The ship has been permanently converted into the administrative headquarters of this new settlement, and its reactor core is in the process of being removed so that it may serve as the colony's temporary power source. Hundreds of small tents and prefab shelters have sprung up around the former starship's massive hull as colonists begin to disembark in large numbers. The first on a bound city on an alien world. And that's going to take a while, though, before it's actually colonised and useful to us. And there's that other guaranteed world over there. Size 20, okay. Size 20 to size 17. Certainly had worse than that, but also had better. Okay, ground defence planning is finished. Next up, then... Oh, definitely planetary unification. The archaeological site continues. It's a dud. Oh. Despite our best efforts, the excavation and analysis of the alien indicators on the surface have failed to deliver any relevant results. The archaeological teams have calculated and followed the paths of the alien signal beams, but nothing is being pointed at other than empty space. Scientist Squaff has requested more time, convinced that something has been missed by the science teams. I believe in you, Squaff. Mostly because of your name. So glad you're long lived. Kinda just want to rename everyone in the Empire to Squarth. All names have been replaced with Squarth. That would be phenomenal. Most words, in fact, have been replaced with Squarth. It's like a, um, a Groot situation, but weird. Okay, not the precursor I wanted, honestly. It doesn't really fit the theme, and I don't really like it as much as some of the others. Okay, the Cybrex. We have discovered artifacts from an ancient civilization on Cathia 3. Uh, somewhere around here, I think there. No? Where's the scientist that's discovered this? Oh, it's this world, the actual um, habitable world, okay. Incredibly, this civilization, which apparently referred to itself as the Cybrex, seems to have been made up of machines that were linked together in some sort of collective consciousness. The age of the artifacts indicate that they were active some 600,000 years ago, in this portion of the galaxy at least, but we have learned nothing of their exact origins. According to the partial data fragments that our scientists managed to extract from one of the artifacts, the Cybrex at some point launched a crusade to destroy all sapient organic life in the galaxy for reasons unknown. Essentially the opposite to us. Uh, what does the uh, museum exhibits do again? It's one of these ones I never end up using. Uh, oh, you only culture workers makes the culture workers more efficient, so maybe I should have gone with the um, monument. Maybe I'll go with the monument next. Important news, Squarf is now level 3. The first of the archaeological sites have been finished. Breakthrough! Study of the surface revealed that Phoebe was hit eons ago by a small asteroid. The impact was not enough to obliterate the planet, but it did nudge it a fraction out of the original orbit. By analysing the impact, the scientists managed to calculate that Phoebe's initial position of rotation and use that data to rewind the alien indicators to their original position. So essentially they were aiming somewhere else in space, then the world was hit and that knocked off the alignment of them. And there it was, the alien indicator beams suddenly converging on another planet in the system. And we get 300 minerals. You know, so far, I've got to be honest, this has been a really good... Ooh, there it is. A really good, um... There we are. Origin. For just sheer resources. I mean, we get loads of artifacts here. There we are. Squaff's personal ship. I choose to believe as well, only Squaff is aboard here. Ooh, look at that effect there in the middle. I've never really seen that. 
I love the new Necroid chip so much. They're so me. <laughs> Absolutely adore them. Oh, that's why it's got that name. Because it's the research station above that world. Oops. A new anomaly. Our sensors indicate odd irregularities. Yep, sure. Go ahead. I'll probably be skipping some of those um, events like uh, the anomalies. Because there are just so many of them. Maybe focusing on the more interesting ones. Maybe. And now we go to the system of Ziff. Ziff. Squav. <laughs> and then we have our construction ship, Fear of Stasis. Because why not? You see, I never read these, so I never really know what's going on, but what was previously thought to be assorted mountains in the southern hemisphere of the planet have been identified as the massive skeletal remains of a single colossal alien life form. The bones have been dated as... 3.4 billion years old, but our scientists have ruled out that the planet could have supported life on that scale at any point in the planet's history. Science officer gone. Where'd he go? Has prepared a special research project to, d to delve further into this mystery. Okay, gone. Go ahead. Our continued studies of the massive skeletal remains on the planet have managed to shed some light on how the creature ended up on the planet itself. There are very faint residual energy readings that indicate some kind of dimensional portal existed briefly towards the rear of the skeleton. It's always bad when you have dimensional portals at the rear of your skeleton. And that's why I don't eat too much Mexican food. Science officer Gon theorizes that the creature passed through this gateway from another dimension, only to quickly perish in the hostile environment of the planet. Why it did this and where it came from are questions that may never be answered. So literally just we've learned very little of them. It came from somewhere else. Dead. Still, a little bit more physics research and some experience for Gon. Well done, Gon. You now have an expertise in computing. <laughs> Materials and computing, and yet I have you on a science vessel. I'm sorry. I just, I need you there right now, I'm afraid. And what are you? You're an expert in bureaucracy and governing. Well, I'm very sorry that your society degree has ended up with you just on a science vessel. And let's go with mind and body. By embracing a combination of new meditation techniques and healthier eating habits, a large segment of our population enjoys a greater life expectancy than ever before. Our archaeological team have started their work down on Herchlog. Um, seismographic readings quickly isolated a hollow area underground on the rough location indicated by the alien indicators previously discovered. Oh, it's... M okay, um, a little bit of a brain fart there. My brain just loaded for a second. That means heartbeat in German. I am... 95% uh, certain about that. Herschel, yeah, it'd be heartbeat, right? I am almost certain about that. I'll Google it in a moment. Why is the planet called heartbeat? Is a better question. The underground expanse is vast, and despite its mysteries, uh, sorry, its mysterious nature, one thing is beyond doubt amongst the experts. It's not natural. Someone built it with a specific purpose in mind. Okay. Oh, well, that actually adds clues as well for the next one, so it's speeding you along. E, we have coil guns. Fantastic. And now let's... Oh, actually, no. Let's go with carrier operations. Because these are also good for trade um, protection, which I imagine our empire would be very much in favor of. Okay, let's just do that. There we go. Um, oh, not enough power. There we go. It's currently called Famine. I don't know what to call the interceptors. Um, uh, sorry, the corvettes. Yeah, I need a name for all the ships, and I can't think of a good theme right now. Like Liberator, something like that, something um, freedom-y. Oh my god, I'm so dumb. Just as I was going to Google um, Herchlag, Fever, it, it, it's Fever. It's Fever in German. I was just, I so wasn't thinking about languages when I saw them. Oh, my German relatives would be slapping me right now for being so slow to even get that. I have heard these words countless times. I can't pronounce them right, as I've said multiple times. My reading and writing in German is significantly better than my uh, speech in it, but... Yeah. Yeah. Okay, here's another one. Star patterns. I almost always go with it was a malfunction to get the influence. This time I won't. Let's see what happens. The latest sensory readings from the planet have showed the star pulsating regularly, but when the crew on the Shrouded Hope arrived... 
On site, there was no evidence to support this data. While most of the crew are in agreement that the anomaly was caused by a sensory malfunction, science officer Mearson discards this theory. Mearson claims to have discovered similar pulsating energy emission patterns elsewhere, and now fears that something strange is happening to the galaxy's stars. They have charted the course to the nearest affected star. Sure. Where is the nearest affected star? Pulsating stars. Okay, quite far away. Let's um, alter your course then. You're going to rush directly to that. Well, you're going to survey along the way, of course. But you're going that way now. Herchlag. Herchlag. I'm trying to pronounce this correctly and I'm not. I I cannot remember how this is pronounced in the slightest. Herchlag. I think I said like log at the start. Like Herchlog. Yeah. I'm going to just stop trying at this point. Still haven't googled it though, so, yeah. Ship sensors are picking up an unexplained pattern of interference in the system. So Unified Science finished, giving us some lovely society in physics. This was the one with the interference. Um, the diseased Ambition crew has succeeded in isolating a signal embedded within the usual pattern of interference in the system. The signal is a song, a complex sonification of an advanced mathematical equation, to be precise, and one that the science officer, Lilhan, cannot seem to get out of their head. Who or what may have composed this song remains unknown, though its complexity infers an incredible level of technological sophistication regarding subspace harmonics. Well, yay for a little bit of research. And over here, ooh, something waiting. The excavation crew has finally reached the underground structure. Vast, angular halls and tunnels were exposed. A complete lack of adornment made it difficult to establish the purpose of the structure. When Squaff entered the main chamber, a deep sound suddenly reverberated initially, just thundering noise. The sound slowly contorted until an incorporeal voice spoke a single sentence in their language. Are you ready? The booming voice was followed by deep, by a deep rumble as one of the giant walls slowly slid away to reveal a dark corridor. Our archaeologists eagerly went inside. Also, love the artwork. Tread lightly. We now have access to blue lasers, so naturally, let's also get improved deflectors. This planet is exceptionally rich in minerals. Minerals that are unfortunately of no use to us. However, science officer Mearson, my god, you're doing so much at the moment, Mearson, believes that many elements in the crust of the planet can be transformed into potentially more useful forms through positron bombardment. Yeah. Good luck. Let's see if uh, that works. Is it an actual event or does it just happen? Normally I don't allow that. Oh, it's this one over here. Why were you all over there, then? Prepare the bombardment. Hey, orbital research and mandate. Oh, yeah, the mandates. Need to focus on that, because that's what our leaders are going to be putting forward. Completely forgot it even existed. The first colony is now actually active. Way too much stuff. Okay, so it was successful, it seems. Rock potential. The crew of the Shrouded Hope, that's this one over here, are pleased to report that the experiment was a success and a significant number of dense mineral veins on the planet have been transmuted into usable resources. So we have plus six minerals now on that little moon. There is a small object in orbit around this planet. It was a mummified pilot. The mummified remains of a single individual belonging to a previously unknown mammalian species have been found drifting in high orbit of the planet. The being is dressed in what appears to be a flight suit complete with a helmet and may be a fighter pilot that ejected in some ancient battle, only to be forgotten and left behind. Our study of the corpse has provided some interesting data. Or data. Or dats. Finally, we get to see our colony ship. Looks like a shield. Which is quite fitting. Okay, we found a strategic resource, some Zro. 
If ingested by psionically gifted individuals, this aerosol can act as a very potent and potentially addictive drug that enhances psi abilities. Uh, for those who know the backstory of what Zro actually is through one of the other precursors, it makes this a bit more uh, interesting. A bit of a spoiler, I want to say it anyway. The Zro is essentially ground up psionics. Yeah, they're dead people. Dead people drugs. Drugs made out of dead people. Meanwhile, once again, is this, um. you? Once again, Mirson, I'm afraid you're gonna have to be delayed a little bit. We have found an encrypted signal. Meanwhile, something waiting. The dark corridor led to an empty round chamber. Stepping inside, the disembodied voice spoke yet again, saying that only the deserving may continue. Well, that is definitely going to be Squarf here. Short corridors connected the round chamber to three other small rooms, each containing some kind of physics oriented problem. Squarf believes that these are scientific riddles that, when solved, may provoke some reaction in the structure, but it's all speculation. Good luck, Squarf. We're counting on you. Do the thing. We have re-elected Shiny Plate. Well, she is charismatic, so it makes complete sense there. So then, what is their current mandate? Their mandate is... Planetside Mining. Build at least two mining districts. Okay, well we have um, a good amount of time before that happens. So hopefully um, the populations will, will grow enough on our world so that we can get to that without forcing it. A true sense of kinship has developed between all of the citizens of our great star nation, regardless of their place in the social order. The time it takes for populations to demote has reduced. Which is nice. Oh, one second, that's a big thing to read. But I need one of my bureaucrats back. Boop, there we go. Loves, labours, lost. So it turns out the signal we discovered is actually just a play, and it's speaking in an old archaic version of our own language, in these, thous, and henceforths. It appears to be reciting one of the lost works of Sorden, a renowned honor-bound playwright who lived some 600 years ago. It appears that the broadcasting service, a simple satellite dish protected by a small shelter, is the only non-natural structure on the planet. There is no hint as to who left it here or why, but going by the wear and tear on evidence, it must have been here, so placed shortly here after the play was first written, long before Honorbound learned the secrets of space travel. We can only assume it was left here by ancient vid visitors to Forge, who took a liking to the play and decided to pay our species a strange and unexpected tribute. We would definitely see this as a gift. A gift! We must find a way to thank our mysterious benefactors. Extra xenophile ethics extraction and extra happiness for 60 months. Personally, I would prefer the unity, but... Happiness is important to us. We're nice. Something waiting, full of wonders. All three science puzzles have been completed in the mysterious chambers deep underground the surface of the planet. Just as Squarf suspected, the structure responded to the correct solutions for the alien trials. As the last riddle was solved, a cloudy holographic projection exploded to life in the main chamber. It was a fine resolution depiction of our solar system, along with scrolling instructions for various alien technologies. Another galactic position was indicated by a bright point of light. The search continues. And we get one minor artifact, and zero G refineries are now available to be researched. Which is just a regular research, but now it's always going to be here as a guaranteed. Which is nice, because it also means it won't pop up here, and honestly, it's not one I'm particularly rushing towards. So the next step is Buried Deep, and it is... Oh, it's also within our solar system. Okay, I thought it was going to be in another system. So where is this one? Last Exit. Of here, it turns out that this asteroid has been moved. Yep, there's still thrusters there. We don't know why, but here's some engineering research. There is an encounter. The Alpha Aliens. Space Whales! 
Oh yeah, we would investigate them instantly. Oh wait, who just leveled up? Lil Hun has leveled up and is now meticulous, increasing chance of finding anomalies. Aw, baby space whale. Our governor, sadly, has been proven to be somewhat inefficient. Candia, you have reached arrested development. You may need to be replaced. Efficiency is definitely a thing, but also they have been serving us well up until this point. Do we fire them just because they've reached the end of their particular skill level? Or do we keep them around being inefficient? I actually don't know how this empire would um, deal with that. Admiral Bowen will be our first ever admiral because they are a trickster, increasing the chance of combat disengagement, essentially meaning there's a lower chance we'll lose ships if they are beaten. Aggressive is the best here in my opinion, but survival. Ooh. Excellent three worlds over there, a desert, arctic, and continental. An unusual whoa, 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 Gaia? Ah, oh, Prestine Jewel, darn it, yep, it's a holy world of a fallen empire, we can't actually have it. Ah, oh, all my hopes. Oh, there are signs of an ancient precursor civilization on this inhospitable rock. Wonderful. And you can finally go ahead with the um, pulsating stars research. Oh dear, star crazy. The crew on the Shrouded Hope have made an unfortunate discovery. Like they suspected, the pulsating pattern observed from Meneth was in fact due to a sensory malfunction in Science Officer Merson's head. Science Officer Merson has turned erratic and suffers delusions about the star's pulsating coded warnings about the coming apocalypse and of having been appointed protector of the realm. The crew believes that she herself manipulated the ship's sensory data during a psychotic spell. Psychotic? Psychotic spell even. Merson is now in a medical pod heading back to Forge where she will receive treatment. Thank you for your service, Merson, Protector of the Realm. <laughs> well, there goes Merson. Oh, that was so not worth it on so many levels. Okay, we need a new one. Um, first of all, we need the resources to hire a replacement. I think I'm going to go with an archaeologist. Yeah, we've seen loads of archaeology at the moment. I definitely think we'd be going for one of those. There's also a site over here we'd want. So, Dayan will be replacing the Protector of the Realm. <laughs> oh, what a shame. What an absolute shame. <laughs> I discovered so much. Okay, yeah, but grab that one first. <laughs> Meanwhile, on the next world, buried deep. Sealed bunker. After a long, arduous period of digging deep into the crust of Last Exit, the excavation team has reached another underground structure. Despite readings indicating that this building is hollow, no entry point can be found. It appears to be hermetically sealed, and the protective walls are made of some unknown material with extreme structural integrity. Conventional digging equipment doesn't even scratch it. It'll require some serious effort to get through, but the project is already underway. Good luck, Squaff. Our factions have finally arrived. So, we have, in order of power, the Alien Tolerance Organization, which is our xenophile group. We have the Military Officers Association, which is our militarist. We have the Free Thought Movement, which is our libertarian, which really love us. 94% approval already. Oh look, we've basically just accidentally chose all the correct options, we'll get into that in a second. And finally, with the hammer and sickle, we have the Social Prosperity Association, with no current leader, which is our cooperative um, faction. So, the only negative I can do anything about right now is with you. So with the most popular, we need to find a new contact, there's nothing else we can really do to please them, they are... Very difficult to please. 55% approval. The military is happy. It wants us to change our war philosophy to liberation wars. Okay, I will do that right now then. So unrestricted, changing to liberation. Essentially, this means we can change the ideology of other empires rather than going to normal war with them. So that's pleased them a lot. 
plus 20%, so now they're 80% approval. And of course, the more approval you have your factions, the more influence you get from them. And since we are libertarians, we get more influence from our factions, plus 25% in fact. So making them happy is a priority. With our free thought movements, personal weapons allowed, we've already chose that. Freedom of speech, we've already allowed that. Anti-autocracy, uh, we're just not an autocracy. Free movement, we've allowed that. And reproductive freedoms, yep, everything is already done. So with you, you really want a planned economy. You are the weakest of the factions, so the one I'll pay less attention to. You want an education campaign? Okay, that I could do. Actually, it costs a fair bit of energy. No, actually, we can't even do that yet. So that's something in the future. You want nutritional plenitude? Um, I actually quite like that myself, so I may end up with that as one of our edicts. And you want the planned economy. Now, this is a weird one. So, economic stance, planned. Oh, look at all the stuff it does. Okay, let's have a quick breakdown of this. Planned. Nationalization of energy generating industries allow for more predictable and sustainable economic development, not relied on uncertain market fluctuations. Only social development and growth and construction trade policies are available. That's not quite true. It looks like some of the others are also available. Mining, subs subsidizing, growth and construction, etc. Um, what else is there? So this will give us plus 20% energy from jobs. That's a big deal. Plus 5% um, growth speed. That's nice. Extra build speed. Extra ship build speed. Colony development speed is increased. Market fee is increased by 20%. So the market becomes far less of a useful thing for us. But it does make cooperative more attractive, which is really nice for our empire. The free market, we literally can never do because we don't have competitive at all. Which is actually the one I prefer. I don't think I've ever used the planned um, economic stance before. That is really brutal. So we have to change our trade policy from wealth creation to essentially any of these, I believe. Social development, growth and construction. Okay, so not any of them. Can't even do that one just yet because I've got the tech. So which one are we going to swap it to? Social development, what's that? Tried value now earns us unity and consumer goods and society research. No energy at all though. But of course we're getting plus 20% energy from jobs. So tried value is now purely for, well it's being invested into our people completely. Wait, we can't have consumer... Oh, I was hoping we just have consumer benefits. Or marketplace of ideas. I like both of those. Okay, sure. We'll go into... Um... We could do growth and construction. Minerals and food it gets turned into. No, I think I'd rather have consumer goods and unity. So now we can go with planned. This is going to change a lot of our stats. Oh, that's a lot of energy gone. Yep, we need to uh, focus more on our generator districts. Uh, like now, please. Thank you. And now we have the planetary unification, giving us more unity. And now we're going to um, genome mapping. Let's start making our people healthier. Wow, you're really happy now, though. 89%. Yep, that really, really, really makes you happy. Plus 10%. Whereas before, it's minus yeah, we are very happy factions. The least happy, sadly, is our most popular, but um, hopefully they'll be happier once we find another empire. Which, where is the other empires? Okay, I'm going to end it here, because looking at the footage, I have way too much already. Um, so, feedback is very, very, very incentivized right now, because I'm not quite sure how I'm going to do things. Do I keep on reading almost all the events out loud? Do I um, try to cut them down a bit and just overview them? What do you want to see from this? Really, I am very keen to see how people want to see this play through going, and hopefully it's popular enough, because it is still quite a lot of effort because it's Stellaris, but I had so much fun today just going through all the minor details. Normally, I would be rushing ahead just to try and get to the next stage, because, of course, full playthroughs and everything take... 60 hours plus sometimes and that's with me being quick this time it's more just about experiencing the game and going through all the little details so with that likes favorite shares comments all that good stuff helps out me helps out the channel and most importantly shows that stellaris is a series you wish to see continued in the future really do hope you've enjoyed this and have a lovely day and do take care and of course happy holidays
This is being recorded on New Year's... Uh, sorry, Christmas Eve. Almost uh, teleported into the future there. Maybe I am in the future. It looks exactly the same. Kind of boring, actually. <laughs>